This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Telling stories to teach supernatural, spiritual truth. Straight ahead on a view from the bunker. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell Special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. Jesus used storytelling in the form of parables to teach spiritual truths. And certainly the enemy, the fallen realm, has uh, used storytelling to great effect. From The Da Vinci Code to 2001 A Space Odyssey, E.T., uh, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, uh, b basically anything coming out of Hollywood that deals with the supernatural, teaching a false, a wrong cosmology. So why do we as Christians not do more with storytelling? Joining me today are a pair of brothers who are trying to do just that. They were gracious enough to have me on their podcast not long ago, uh, The Goslings, so-called Goslings with two S's. You'll see why in just a moment. I love the tagline for their podcast, Interviews That Strike Down the Darkness. They're the sons of Gospel Music Hall of Famer Larry Goss. Uh, Nick started his writing career in 2018 when his kids got old enough that uh, he needed to use epic levels of creativity to keep them entertained. And now that has led to a series of books called The Traveler's League, book one, The Timepiece, and his brother Jonathan, who raised in a home with strong theological background, a lot of church uh, mixed uh, background, his upbringing with a love for fantastical storytelling and medieval warfare. And that has uh, turned into the six books of the Heavenly Realms series. Six novels so far, beginning with Empyrean Falling, which I've just begun to read. And uh, we welcome to the program for the first time, Nick and Jonathan Goss. Nick, Jonathan, welcome to the bunker. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having us. Hey, thank you. At least I could do. Uh, not least, I mean, you guys were gracious enough to have me on your program, but seeing that you guys are uh, prolific writers of fiction from a Christian worldview, um, we need to stick together and, and talk this up a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get into what inspires you and how you all got started on this, but uh, I just want to get your, your sense of where... Christian fiction is today because the last real close dealings that Sharon and I had with it was back in 2002, 2003, mm. as we were starting to write a series, the two of us together, where we were writing in the same fictional universe, writing mm. independently oh. of each other, but sharing plot points and sharing characters. Oh, that's cool. And now here we are in 2022, 20 years later, we're actually coming yeah. back to that uh, idea and uh, we're going to actually work her Red Wing saga into this uh, series that started back in 02 with her novel, uh, Winds of Evil. But cool. um, we found as we attended the uh, Christian Bookseller Association convention in Atlanta, and then she mm -hmm. attended an, a second one in uh, Nashville. Uh, I was tied up uh, doing something else. And our, our sense was that Christian fiction was mainly um, stories about Amish women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Have uh -huh. have things changed? I mean, we've we've essentially published our own stuff now since since then, since about 2007. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh I've not really paid that much attention, quite honestly. There's not much in the way of Christian fiction that I found all that interesting. What yeah. what is it like these days? Yeah. Well, I I'll if you don't mind me jumping no, in go there. For it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's funny you say Amish women because uh <laughs> when when I go to I've gone to uh the homeschool conference because I'm a homeschool dad. Uh, teach them diligently. And they have an enormous uh, uh, section downstairs where they're, you know, all, you know, hundreds of booths. And uh, most of the people represented at those conferences are people of faith, they're Christians uh, for the most part. 
And a lot of these booths are selling Christian fiction. And the reason that it's so frustrating finding anything written recently that's Christian fiction, and it all kind of falls into that giant. It's always like the Amish women or the frontier <laughs> woman mm-hmm. uh, uh, or or it's just Bible stories, repackaged Bible stories for kids. Mm-hmm. And it, it – Samson and Delilah yeah. with, uh, with the football player and the cheerleader. Yeah, you know? mm, kind of. Yeah. But I mean, if, if they even get that creative with it, oh. uh, you know, it's I think what's happened is that at least in middle grade, at least in the genre that I write in. There has been this enormous infusion of secular values and leftist values mm. that are infiltrating middle grade fiction and. It's been infiltrating young adults, the next age group up, for a long, long time. So there's nothing wholesome out there that parents can trust that's secular. And when they see something that looks and smells or might they might suspect is kind of secular, that doesn't neatly fit these, you know, check all the boxes of what they have in their mind as Christian fiction, they kind of avoid it. So I think a lot of Christian authors are, you know, trying to sell low hanging fruit, something that looks and smells and seems wholesome. They want something wholesome for their kids. So if it's not something like if it's not the, you know, pioneer women or Amish women, it's something that uh was written, you know, the C. S. Lewis's, mm. the the Tolkien's, um, stories written in the nineteenth century that are that are wholesome. Uh, So they're kind of like falling on these. Pilgrim's progress. Yeah. And the other thing, and this is what drives me nuts, is that they're afraid to write. They're afraid. There's nothing that's like creative as far as fantasy goes. They don't want to. They don't want to jump into fantasy because they're afraid that they're going to create some universe that might cross the boundaries of what people understand the spiritual world to be in reality. You know, they don't they, – they're afraid to, you know, entertain the idea that, you know, there could be multiple deities in a story because it might confuse the reader. Well, there's only one God. Yeah, but this is fiction. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. And that they, – they don't want to tell something that's not completely in line with, you know, what they believe about the Bible. That's a one-to-one translation. Right. Um, and so it's hard for you to say, you know, it's fiction. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a fictional story. But everything has to doctrinally align with yeah. Scripture. They can't stray from that. So the time piece is out because of the Minotaur, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. My yeah. book. Yeah. So super yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. So in which all is, my books, I have those. those which those which is too bad. I just started reading the time piece and Empyrean Falling, by the way, um, uh-huh. and looking forward to getting deeper into those. Um, but uh, yeah, the Minotaur is something that Sharon has actually worked into one of her Red Wing saga novels. Very wow, cool. Awesome. Yeah. But when you well, look then, you look back at ancient uh, Mesopotamian iconography, the uh, uh-huh. artwork that depicts their gods and supernatural characters, and the bull men, the kusariku, were hmm. a common uh, theme. And, and when you look at the uh, you know the, the cherubim or cherubim, the Hebrews pronounce it, uh, or the Israel, Israelis pronounce it that way, uh, there it's pretty clear from Ezekiel chapter ten. Ezekiel 1 and 10, when you compare the descriptions of the uh, uh, the cherubim, that uh, there is a definite bovid appearance to those things. So mm-hmm. I, I don't see why the Minotaur would be that far out of bounds. And wouldn't the, uh, it, and uh, I believe in Revelation, I think it's Revelation, or Daniel, I can't remember which one, but it describes one of the four spirits around the throne has the appearance of a bull as well. And uh, and that's, you know, one of the four chair, one of the throne guardians. Oh yeah, has that appearance, if I'm not mistaken, and it seems like a lot of the uh, Baal worship too. You right. know, the uh, well, not just Baal worship, but uh, a- ancient pag- pagan worship from the region. You know, the the idols were always bulls, yeah. Jeroboam, the golden calf, oh, right, like, right. I mean, the chief, the chief god of Canaan, uh, his his main epithet was Bull El, and oh, yeah. uh, scholars have uh, dug deeper and found that the. Uh, <laughs> probable origin of the name Titan for the old gods of the Greeks who were banished to uh, Tartarus it was the name of an ancient Amorite tribe called the Tidanu who were so hmm. frightening to the ancient Sumerians the last Sumerian kings of Mesopotamia the third dynasty of Ur built a wall 175 miles long to try to make Sumer great again and keep the Tidanu out and uh, it didn't work obviously because the kingdom fell around the time that Abraham was born but uh, that word, Tadanu, comes from the Akkadian word for bison or aurochs or bull. 
Wow. So there's a very wow. old, if Kronos, in fact, comes from the Semitic word uh, karen or karnu, mm-hmm. that means horns, mm-hmm. the horned one. So yeah, yeah there, there's a very old uh, imagery, some very old imagery there. Um, but when, yeah. and, and when you start digging into the Bible, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a thing that most of us have not been taught in churches, angelology. Mm-hmm. I mean, the seraphim, yeah. the cherubim, the wheels within wheels, the ophanim, mm-hmm. the malachim. Um, you, you dive into this a lot in your, your Heavenly Realm series, Jonathan, uh, the, the nature of the angelic realm. Um, yeah. How, how uh, inspired were you by the depictions of the Bible and how far did you have to go outside of the Bible to kind of inform your description of those supernatural characters? You know, I took a very, this always disappoints people, I took a very anthropomorphic approach because um, I had a friend, or I have a friend, who did that with a movie script version of what he was, uh, of the same kind of story. And um, I found it to be sort of like what Matt Stone and Trey Parker have depicted in the past, or, or what they say is like, you don't want a hat on top of a hat. You know, you can have, you can wear a hat. But then if you put a hat on a hat, it's weird. You know, one hat's cool. Two hats is weird. And like I was trying to tell this this very intense cosmic drama, you know, of the fall of Lucifer. And and in these books, it's sort of simplified the transformation into Satan, you know, and the and the leading of the one third into a rebellion. And uh, I wanted to do that at first. I had this idea of having all these mythological creatures, like my friend who was writing the, you know, um, the movie script. Uh, well, I shouldn't say mythological, but biblically fantastical, you know, creatures. Um, and then I realized, like, for me at least, maybe it's my limitation as a writer. Like, I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't make that work. Maybe I'm not creative enough, but like, I couldn't make that work. From a dramatic sense. Mm. So what I ended up doing was crafting a very fictionalized narrative, which is sort of explained in the author's note in the beginning that like, look, this is a fictional interpretation. This is not meant to supersede anything in the Bible. But I basically dress them up in human garb so that it would become more accessible. You know, uh, now there are monsters in the Heavenly Realm series. Um, one of them uh, actually, coincidentally, is kind of uh, a bull god of sorts, Mazarel. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is my creation uh, from whole cloth. <clears throat> he's just he's like my version of like I wanted a bad guy who could be Satan's right hand man who could do all the terrible things that I can't really have Satan do because he's still tr- he's embodying Lucifer and he's trying to be like this, you know, magnanimous, you know, um, savior type, you know, mm-hmm. but you still need a bad guy who can just like be vicious, mm-hmm. you know, the scourge of the faithful. So I created this character, Masriel, who ends up looking like a minotaur in a lot, <laughs> in a lot of ways. He is like, yeah. he's like, if yeah. you mix Hellboy with Satan from South Park yeah. and, you know, and like a minotaur all into one, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So it, it's funny how, like, even when you try to, diverge from that and create something that's going to be more accessible. And a lot of people really liked the fact that the angels are, they look like us, you know, in the heavenly realm series. A lot of people also did not, they were disappointed by it, you know, but it's like, even in your attempt to anthropomorphize and make this as accessible as possible, Mm -hmm. you still end up coming right back around (laughs) to like the thing that you avoided and doing the very (laughs) thing that you avoided in the first place. And it worked out beautifully, but it was like, if I did too many of those, for me, I felt like I probably would have I probably would have failed at it for my own writing ability, especially at the time, because I started these when I was 17. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, I was ironically been writing a long time. I was at Lighthouse. I went to Lighthouse Christian, a little Baptist, uh, you know, uh, prep school uh, in Antioch, Tennessee. And uh, and I was sitting there in chapel class junior year ignoring the sermon that the principal was preaching and just started writing that first scene chapter one um in the beginning of empyrean falling when uh when lucifer is talking to the seraph maildus you know and, mm-hmm. and it just sort of blossomed out from there so i think if i had done it later especially after reading your stuff and gary wayne stuff i probably would have been more adventurous 
I probably would have like had the chops to make it weirder. You know what I mean? <laughs> you so. know, the, Sharon and I were just talking about that this afternoon because uh, I've gone back and I've started rereading some of her older stuff and my older stuff. Um, the the God conspiracy we republished mm-hmm. last year because it dealt with the experimental medical procedure that was oh. recommended, and those who denied or d- d- oh, yes. decided not yeah d- there were camps involved and all sorts of other things mm-hmm. uh yep. it, it suddenly became a lot more relevant mm-hmm. than it had been back in 2005 but uh, uh-huh. i had to change some of the theology because of things that have changed since then the things that i've learned since then yeah. and sharon said yeah the same thing is true with the uh, earlier novels like winds of evil and um signs and wonders which we're probably going to republish by the end of this year but um, it it is interesting when you tr- you're trying to reach for that and teach and not really understanding the theology mm-hmm. behind it. What's really interesting, and, and Nick, I, I, I'm curious about this, especially since you're writing yeah. for a younger audience. Do you find yeah. how, uh, it, it is what Jonathan said to be true for you as well? Like, how is your uh, better understanding of theology affected your ability to create uh, characters and write this fantastic fiction for younger readers? <laughs> Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, with, with, when the series first started, it was really just it was really just a story that my son and I were making up together. Hmm. <laughs> he wanted me. You know, he was eight years old at the time. I read to him every night at bedtime, and one night he wanted a break from the routine and asked if we could just make up something together. And so I just started making up something. I thought of a magic timepiece. There's this boy. I let him name the character, and he. When he sets the timepiece to one o'clock, it magically takes him to this fantasy world. And uh, by the end of the, you know, us doing that for two hours, I said, "Okay, that's the end of the one o'clock world. I'm tired. We're going to do two o'clock tomorrow night. No, I want to do two o'clock. No, we're going to do two o'clock tomorrow night. So the next night we made up a two o'clock world and so forth. So it went on for about two weeks. And uh, every night he was just so interested in what was going to happen next, what the next world would be. That my wife said, hey, you should really think about maybe self-publishing this, like turn it into a book for other kids to enjoy. Uh, So I did, made some slight edits here to the plot, you know, here and there. Uh, But really, I wasn't trying to tell a story. I wasn't trying to set up something that would have an altar call at the end. That's not the intention of the book. I I was desperate for something that was... You know, a fantasy, it was engaging, it gave kids an adventure, and it had values that parents could trust their kids to expose their kids to. You know, loyalty to friends, Um, being brave, realizing you can't be brave if there's no fear, you know, Uh, just just good themes, strong things, doing the right thing no matter what. You know, as you'll see at the end of the book. The main character has a really, really hard decision to make. He can either make something – he can make a decision that he knows deep, deep, deep down is the right thing to do or he can make the the alternate decision Mm -hmm. against his conscience and be a part of this group of – child heroes this these It'd lost these friends that he's been dying to have in his life and he finally finds his tribe so to speak yeah. mm. you know so he's got to make a really really hard choice yeah you know and then uh, so it's those themes that i want kids to read and be exposed to and have a great story that uh they can get lost in a fantasy world uh you know it's funny because when i you know when i read you know the chronicles of narnia like so many people did you know I, as a kid I was unaware of the theology until, you know, the stone table cracked and Aslan came back from the grave. I was like, oh, I recognize this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so that's what's going on. Uh-huh. But up to that yeah. point in the first book, uh, I was just like, man, this is an amazing fantasy mm-hmm. story, you know, and which is why I love Lord of the Rings so much. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, you have to really, really try hard and do some gymnastics to – extract gospel messaging mm-hmm. from the Lord of the Rings. But there's no logos there. There's that's right. There's the th- there's the themes of it, there are it's logos driven. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Uh but it's a beautiful, wonderfully spun story and you're always rooting for those who are true. You know, those who are brave. Yeah. Those who are just trying to save their friends. Right. You know, and I wanted that. I wanted a piece of that. Yeah. In, in my book. So I wasn't I wasn't looking for an altar call altar call per se. Um, unlike 
a, the my first and only so far venture into young adult writing. Um, I wrote a paranormal urban fantasy for young adults called Henry Half Moon, and it is a it's it's a mix of Greek gods. Uh, there's Christianity in there. Uh, there is the Anunnaki. Hmm. Uh, even the even the Babylon working is mentioned. Hmm. So I'm throwing all of these really weird things in there. It's and he, right and up the, your alley, Derek. And he's <laughs> having really like it. Yeah. Yeah. And when you read, it, you're going to be like, Oh no, this isn't how things work. This no, is not right, what that yeah, meant. Yeah. But I'm taking elements and I'm creating this 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 fantasy this, sure. this story. Uh, but in that one, uh, it was very evident at the end. That the real God, the true God behind everything that was going on was Christ. Was, yeah. it, this was this was Jesus that was in control. This Jesus is the one that you know, essentially called Henry to basically be a demon slayer yeah. in the other realm. Yeah. And uh, kind of a grim reaper type, only his job is to slay you know, gargoyle-esque demons. From in the, the abyss. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, but, it, he, but even Henry doesn't know that. He doesn't want to believe. He's cynical. Yeah. His parents were trying to raise him that way. He doesn't believe all that. He knows there's just more out there. Typical college. Who kid. knows what the real truth is, but there's something more there than what people yeah. will believe. And then he goes on this fantastic journey and only at the end. Which does is he, a cool does he, spiritual journey. Yeah. N- yeah. Only at the end is he like, now I get it. Yeah. Now I get it. Yeah. You know. Now, oh, mom and dad are right. Yeah. So in a way. <laughs> they were right about Jesus and I've just been a jerk this whole time. In a way. And this is highly. Yeah. yeah. This is not theologically accurate, but in a way, there is kind of an altar call, but imagine an altar call after you die, <laughs> which is like nobody's going to be like, mm, that's not how it is. But I'm not trying to write a, you know, a theology, a theologically accurate story. I'm not trying to fit this into a theological framework. I'm trying to tell a great story. And in that case, that points people to, you know, directly to Christ yeah. at the end. And that's the thing. If you can point people to the Bible, if you can point people to Christianity, you know, mm-hmm. to Jesus, then, you know, and as long as you're not directly trying to to interfere, interpose fictional elements onto what the Bible says, you know, you can create something that deals in the spaces of silence, you know, where, you know, it's not really talked about a whole lot or it's super interpretive. Like, like what Nick deals with is kind of some of the stuff in Revelations with Henry Halfman, mm. you know, and then what I deal with, you know, is like the visions that people have seen of these angels. It's like, well, are you a literalist or is this interpretive or, you know, is this metaphorical somehow, you know, and it's it's in those like gray areas that I think you can sort of get away with crafting your your own story that you're capable of telling mm-hmm. that still gives the message without violating anything. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's and because that's super important. You don't want to you don't want to stand in violation of whatever the Bible says, no. you know, because that defeats the whole point. The yeah. whole point is to make people say, wow, yeah, Henry Half Moon's journey is kind of like, you know, my journey in a not so literal way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, yeah, Henry Half Moon and the Travelers League series for the middle grade, you know, there were the stories that, you know, I think. I wanted to read. They were, they were the type of story that right. I wanted to read that I thought was lacking out there. <clears throat> yeah. You know, something that was willing to, you know, violate the established rules mm-hmm. of what Christian fiction is supposed to be and uh, violate it without offense in yeah. a way. Like yeah. just just not try to follow the norm. I just want so I want that fantasy. I want that fun fantasy. I want that fun paranormal mm-hmm. element to the story. Uh, without you know people feeling like they're reading something that's going to be a a danger a danger or detriment to you know their their faith yeah or their children's faith in any way and it's not no what kind of feedback have you gotten on on the creative aspects of your writing and I ask this because one of the reasons we began investigating self publication back as early as 2005 was because the publisher who was a traditional Christian publishing house dipping its toes into the water of fiction back around that uh, that time. Um, they had published Sharon's first novel, Winds of Evil. Uh, the second novel was getting close. Um, they'd, uh, they'd also, had they done the Armageddon strain? I think they had. And uh, they were editing my first novel, The God Conspiracy, and uh, they were just getting really kind of squeamish. You guys have crop circles really? and UFOs in here and uh, government conspiracies. 
<laughs> which we learned are, were much more popular during the Clinton years among oh, Christian yeah. publishers than during the George W. Bush years. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So we just said, okay, fine. We'll just, you know, say, thanks. It's been a good experience. We'll move on. Um, yeah. For the most part, people have been very positive about the the storylines and the theology that's in there. Admittedly, not perfect theology, but what kind of response have you gotten from uh, the the creative uh, aspects? Are there what, what kind of pushback? What kind of uh, encouragement? Well, I, do you want to go or? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I will say you mine, go first, and then I'll. Mine go. was yeah. uh, so I first uh, attempted to get published in two thousand five. Um, and then I attempted again in 2008, kept writing during that time. But 2005 was when I finished the first draft of Empyrean Falling, uh, which was a, a nightmarish 1147-page brick. Um, yeah, <laughs> so no wonder. Uh, but both times, both times that I was rejected by pretty much every publishing company, it was like – <clears throat> the Christian, the secular publishers won't touch anything that's overtly Christian, and my stuff was has always been overtly Christian, you know. Um, the Christian publishers didn't want to touch anything uh, that I had written because it was too violent, you know. Because uh, these are right, right. It's like it's like Gladiator, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, they got swords, they got shields, you know. They like those things do things, um, and uh, and they didn't like it because. Um, Lucifer, um, trying to remember how they put it. Uh, Lucifer was problematic to certain Christian publishers because uh, he had teeth in his arguments. He's ultimately wrong, mm-hmm. you know, and and there, it boils down to the theme of the book mm-hmm. of of the first book, which is replace fear with faith. You know, Lucifer slash Satan operates out of fear and pride and michael operates out of faith and mm-hmm. you know humility and because of that michael's the good guy you know and uh, anyways so but they didn't like it because it wasn't um it wasn't that that feel good kind of mm-hmm. warm and fuzzy sort mm-hmm. of amish lady in the countryside <laughs> fiction you know that right. we were talking about yeah. it's uh you know it kind of was its its own sort of animals. So the, and they just didn't think it was very marketable. And, uh, and in a way, when you look at sales, they were kind of right. It is very niche, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had a lot of great, ex- uh, feedback and experiences from, um, a lot of men, uh, which makes sense. Cause I wrote it between, I wrote the whole seven novel series from the time I was 17 to the time I was 26 or 28. 27 ish uh over a decade i mean it's a huge body of work yeah and and i took time off i actually owe my ability to publish on amazon uh to nick because i had given up and then uh nick published in 2018 Mm -hmm. is that right yep um the year mom died and uh and i saw him do it and like you know how it was back in the day Derek. like self-publishing was just a, a an expensive vanity project right yeah you know there was you know what i mean like if you if you couldn't get published through a traditional publisher back in all the way up to probably the late 2000s, maybe early 2010s, you were sunk. It was either that or you're like the crazy person at the at the UFO expo with the pamphlet of, you know, like, you know, <coughs> moon documents mm-hmm. um, <laughs> in a binder, you know. Um, so it just, you know, I had given up basically. And uh, but I realized that those books um my niece told me she got into the first one. And she was like, "Oh, this is a boy book." I'm like, "Yes, of course it's a boy <laughs> book." You know, it's about warrior angels, you know, fighting each other, and and like they're all dudes, you know. Yeah. So, um, I've had a lot of good feedback from fighting age males, uh, which is kind of who these books are written mm-hmm. for. Which is kind of a detriment because fighting age males are too busy are you working. Saying there's no romance. <laughs> you know what? In <laughs> Sherman Drake, there's romance. Very good. The, because that's the one about the flood. So it's, oh, okay. it's not great romance, but it's there, you know, um, <laughs> you know, because it's angels and women. Yeah. Um, but it is. Uh, uh, there you go. It's yeah. still powerful. Um, so, yeah, that, my experience, my feedback was, um, you know, like I said, I did have some people who were upset that the angels didn't look like their literal depictions in the Bible mm-hmm. at certain times that they were anthropomorphized. Um and then I had some people who couldn't connect with it because the target audience was me in a way, like just like with Nick t- talking about he wanted to write 
stuff that he wanted to read. I wanted the same thing. We, I, um, when I was seventeen, the reason why that whole thing got started with uh, with Heavenly Realms is I saw my friends and I snuck into a movie theater to watch Dogma, uh, Kevin Smith's movie. Mm-hmm. You know, and that scene where um, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who are the fallen angels, have that argument in the parking garage, and they're talking about war on God, was like a scene out of a whole other movie. And we were reading Paradise Lost at the time in English AP class. And so it's like those two ideas just sort of connected. Mm -hmm. So some people have really gravitated towards that. And then other people, you know, they just don't connect with it because it's it's so niche or it doesn't meet their expectations. Um, But thankfully, I mean, I've had some people say this got them back into church. I've had some people say this got them back into reading, you know. Um, I have had some really beautiful feedback from some people that really make it worth it. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, if you can just, if you can get like one or two of those, you can, you can put up with a thousand slings and arrows. Yeah. It's totally cool. You know what I mean? Like it's totally worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Well, I'll tell you the worst review I ever got for this middle grade ages eight to 12. Fantasy, this middle grade fantasy was someone who said worst young adult novel ever. The writing was very rudimentary. <laughs> like, yeah, it's for kids. <laughs> right. It's yeah. For children. <laughs> yeah. That's the, uh, that's the point. But it was also the first thing that I ever, it's not published. Dostoevsky. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but that aside, I didn't, <clears throat> when I wrote this, I didn't pursue traditional publishing. I knew from the outset that I wanted to just self publish it. Um, I wanted to self-publish it. Uh, I knew I could get it to, you know, I have a pretty big audience of homeschoolers in this area. It's a big home. We're part of that community. Uh, and I knew I'd have more control over things. And uh, I yeah. never even entertained traditional publishing. <clears throat> I wanted to get it out there and not go through the years of rejections before I finally <laughs> – got it in shape for a traditional publisher publisher to say yes to it yeah. and so i just went for it yeah and got it out there and it ended up being a, I, a, I think a very decent product i think it was very good and um i've as i people who read it the kids who read it they all like it uh when it first came out i was so sensitive to you know the idea that a child might go eh, i didn't really like it you know I, but you've I, never had that experience. No, have you? no. The closest <laughs> I ever got was we went to, <laughs> we went to church and there was this girl. She was about uh, nine years old and she was one of the first handful of kids that read it. And uh, she goes, "Oh!" And she saw me at church. She's like, "Oh, hey, I read your book." I said, "Oh, really? Did you like it?" She goes, "Yeah, you know, it actually wasn't that bad." <laughs> I said, "That's great." Do me a favor. Don't leave me any reviews. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, know, you know how it is, like, Derek, when you give yeah. copies of your book to somebody? They'll say anything. Oh, they'll say anything. And yeah. you want to tell them, like, try right, to sound grown up. You know. Here's a free copy. If you if you like it, leave a review. If you don't like it, keep your mouth shut. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but and it was, and so it was really cute. But uh, a lot of kids really like it. I mean, I've gotten uh, invitations to go to, like, local book clubs run by homeschoolers oh, cool. yeah. you know to come and talk yeah. about it and uh, i've had i've had some good reviews with some other uh, self-published authors yeah. and uh, I, I think the response has been really good uh, and the kids who read it really joy I, i've never heard of a kid reading book one and not wanting to immediately read the next book yeah so they really do get into the story yeah a lot of the themes that we see depicted in the Bible. I'm thinking this morning, our Bible study, Sharon and I recorded uh, an hour on 1 Samuel 13 and 14, which was uh, Saul not waiting for Samuel and offering the sacrifice on his own and Samuel showing up and saying, what have you done? Okay, because of this, you're going to lose the kingdom. And then following that, Jonathan, uh, when the Philistines invaded and were overrunning and the Hebrews were hiding in caves and in holes in the ground and Jonathan and his armor bearer yeah. Jonathan and his armor bearer, two guys. At the garrison. Yeah. And they want to go up to the garrison. And they said, if they if they say, come on up, then that means God has delivered them into our hand. And the armor bearer's like, my heart is where your heart is. Yeah. My heart is with your heart. Do yeah. what your hand finds to do or whatever that, whatever the phrase. But, you know, thinking in my mind, okay, I've seen Israel. Uh, I've seen that area, lots of hills. 
The Philistines had the high ground, which is what you want when you're on defense, because the attacker is going to have to climb up. Plus, we just read that the Israelites didn't have any iron. They had to go to the Philistines to sharpen their plows and sickles. So Mm, they're going up there with inferior weapons, storming up the hill at an entrenched defensible position. And unlike his father, who's like hiding and it's like, well, Samuel wasn't here. So I had to do the sacrifice to try to get God on my side. And Jonathan's like, God will take care of us. Either they'll come down to us and he'll take care of them or they'll say, come up and we'll go. And you see that. And especially when you've got kids of your own or you get to a certain age where you realize that Jonathan was maybe 20, you know, young enough to be almost young enough to be my grandson at this point and think, what a remarkable story this is. Yeah. Yeah. And we just sort of kind of gloss over it, you know? Yeah. No one talks about that. Yeah. What I love about that story too, is that uh, when Jonathan sees the garrison, uh, he obviously he wants God to be on his side and he says, let's go do it. Let's go up there. And perhaps, Yes. God will deliver the Philistines to us. Right. Perhaps. Right. Uh, you know, I'm going to take action and we're going to test the Philistines to see. But, you know, maybe God will, maybe God will. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to leave it in his hands. And yeah. he was, uh, that's, that's faith. That's not what Saul did. Right. No, no, no. He, and, he tried to manipulate God. Yes. Yeah, which, yes. Uh, that's the point. He thought God could be manipulated through sacrifice, through rite and yeah. ritual. And that's where, you know, Sam, that's why Samuel said, no, 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 you, 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 no, you the kingdom's going to be taken away from you. Yeah. Um, but we see values like this depicted in the secular realm all the time. For example, in the uh, fourth season of Stranger Things, which I don't recommend for family viewing, um, mm-hmm. but you see the kids in the story kind of exemplifying that sort of sacrificial bravery. And the one character who uh, sacrifices at all is the one who's based on uh, Damien Eccles, one of the West Memphis Three. Um, oh, really? Oh, yeah. We've yeah. About him He's... Yep. Um, He's the one who basically gives his last full measure in defense of the town that hated him. So uh, he's uh, Eccles' uh, reputation is being whitewashed now through the secular media. But again, it's through the it's through their own actions. Unlike Jonathan, who was like, "Let's go, and maybe God will deliver them into our hands." I'm just going to have faith in Him that whatever comes about, it's it's His will. Yeah. And it, there's a well, good end. And, and 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 but but most secular entertainment, the opposite is true. It's always the work of our right. hands. Even in yeah. the supernatural films like the Stephen King movies, it's never let's pray for deliverance from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's uh, right. hey, we've got some nitroglycerin and some TNT here. Let's blow yeah. up the demons. <laughs> right. Well, it's it's all about that luciferian um you are your own gods, you you manifest your own destiny kind of thing. And and that's the difference between uh, between prayer and witchcraft, which the lines between prayer and witchcraft get very blurry because uh, people think that if they just like, you know, just like the king, if they pray a certain way or if they say a certain thing or if they, you know, if they, you know, hold their tongue a certain way and face the harvest moon. Like, you know, if they say a certain litany or if they Mm -hmm. recite a certain, you know, scripture or whatever, that it has some sort of, some sort of ability to, you know, or, or if they just sort of pray a certain thing, they can trick God, you know, or, and when, you know, the difference between prayer and witchcraft really is just prayer is submitting yourself to the will of God so that you can be, you know, what is it, deep in the current, you know? Mm -hmm. Or you can, you know, pray a certain way to where you are trying to get God to bend to your will, Mm -hmm. you know? and Which is where the prosperity gospel goes so wrong. Oh, my gosh, dude, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, people can, you know, people think witchcraft is like, is all, you know, burning things and, and, you know, curly knives over altars and black robes and stuff. It's like, no, man, witchcraft can look just like prayer. Mm-hmm. It can look just like prayer. It's like, how are you praying? Mm-hmm. Are you are you praying, you know, like the king without mm-hmm. Samuel and making the sacrifice on your own mm-hmm. out of fear? Or are you acting, you know, like Jonathan, his mm-hmm. son, you know, and the armor bearer? And are you just acting out of faith yeah. and just leaving it up to God? Yeah. Instead of trying to force God to do what you want. That's the thing, because a good result, the, positive, the win, the victory for the prayer, 
for the one who prays, all the credit goes to God. Right. In Jonathan's case, he said, perhaps God will give give us the victory, not yeah. perhaps we'll have the victory, and then we can decide of how much credit we want to give God. If we lose, that's on us. Yeah. But if we win, that's on God. Mm-hmm. That was something I tried to um, – it, it repeatedly comes up in Empyrean Falling especially because it's kind of the, the motif is that everything Lucifer does in Empyrean Falling is meant to – solve his daddy issues mm. with God, mm. you know? And, mm-hmm. and and keep in mind, like, all this was written before Supernatural, before Lucifer, like, <laughs> before all these things that, like, you know, oh, that, because they told me there was no market for this stuff. And then I watched, like, over the next 10 years as, like, all these movies and shows come out. I was like, right, right. Oh, this sucks, you know? <laughs> but, but that really yeah. is kind of the difference between, between the two characters that that is very uh, applicable to the human condition. You know, that, you know, Lucifer in the story, Lucifer is the one who builds the white throne because God exists. Their father exists in the Empyrean, which is a higher level of heaven than what they are currently experiencing. They're in this lower realm, which is sort of this Middle Earth esque, you know, analog for, uh, you know, terrestrial environment, corporeal. It's very corporeal. Uh, and so there's this separation. So everything Lucifer does from like crafting the Garden of Eden, you know, and, and being the cherub who walked upon the fiery stones to building the white throne to forming the Eastern Kingdom, you know, all this stuff that's laid out in Empyrean Falling. It's his attempt to much like Jordan Peterson talks about in his Cain and Abel um, lecture. You know, Cain is making all of these erroneous sacrifices. They're sacrifices, but they're not the right ones. You know, and Michael is the one who is he has the faith, you know, whereas his older brother, Lucifer, who also is a cherub, just has his fear and his pride. And Michael is the one who's over here, like just saying, you know what, I'm just going to do what I think God wants me to do. And if I fail, then I fail and I'll go back to the Empyrean and exist with God. And Mm -hmm. sure. Or if I win then we can save humanity from my brother who has lost his marbles, you Mm -hmm. know, and like, and that plays out in a couple of different ways in, in Empyrean falling, you know, especially in the one chapter where like Michael doesn't really know how to, how to do that in in a really great way at one point and it nearly kills him. Um, Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. I mean, he's he's not saved literally by the shadow of the son of God. Yeah. He's not, he's not rebellious, but he's, he's hot headed. He, he, he he has, yeah, he's super convicted passionate, you know, but he's, he's not perfect and kind of dumb, you know, and he's (laughs) willing to stand his ground almost to the point of his own destruction. Yeah. You know, in the face of, you know, his betters but telling his him what he needs to do. Right yeah, his heart's always in the right he's place. He's very Davidic. Yeah, nature, so he's not a perfect you know? good guy, which is what makes him interesting. And Lucifer is not a perfect bad guy. Right. You know, he's not just 100% all bad, no matter what. There's something of interest there. Yeah. That's And that's, you know, Tragic. why the yeah. reason the traditional Christian publishers didn't like the book is is what makes it interesting. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Oh, thank you. Because it allows you to have, you know, it allows you to experience that character in a way that actually makes the story enjoyable. He does not just, here's the pattern. Right. I don't want to read about patterns. I know the patterns. Yeah, we know the story. I know the tropes. Yeah. You know. Well, that was the thing about, about Lucifer that, like, when I was first writing the book, you know, I was I was 17. So, like, I was going through all the things that a teenager goes through in, in <laughs> high school, you know. And a lot of Lucifer's arguments and struggles and grievances, as immature as they are, they were mine. At the time. And and they kind of at various points in your life, they continue to be. So it's like you want to give voice to the stuff that people struggle with. You know, um, mm-hmm. I was talking good. to um, I was talking to Mark Chadwick, who is a, a composer friend of our family. And uh, he was he's writing music for the audiobook un- for the unabridged edition of the audiobook. We're going to mm-hmm. do a score. And he told oh, cool. me uh, last week, he was like, you know, I had. All of this, all of these like big, grand, celestial, heavenly samples ready. Uh, and they're all beautiful. I've listened to them. And he said, you know, but I started reading Empyrean Falling and through our emails and you telling me about the characters. I realized like I need to make the music more human, you know, because mm-hmm. all of these characters struggles. There are struggles there. Every bit of them. 
you know, whether it's Gabriel, Michael, Lucifer, Mazarel, you know, Mm -hmm. I I mean, even the darkest of the dark deals with the same stuff that you and I deal with all the time throughout our lives. And you got to hear about that. It's one of, one of the things that I read about writing that, that has resonated with me. And I I don't know that I've ever mastered this. Sharon is very good at it. Uh, Ben Bova, well-known science fiction writer, legendary science fiction author, uh, wrote that each character in in the plot has to believe that the story is about him that he is the hero of the story he yes. may be just a secondary character a walk on mm-hmm. but even for that one page that he gets as a secondary or tertiary character he's got to think that the story is all about him otherwise oh, so he becomes a cardboard cutout that you just move across the screen right. and you know moves off again just to and and it it affects the believability of the world the the depth yeah. of the world that you've created um, yeah. But that means that when it comes to characters like Lucifer or uh, the, the wizard Braxo, uh, you've got oh, to get yeah. inside the mind of the character and empathize with him to write the, his, his character as though he's really the hero. How right. difficult is it to get inside the mind of a villain, especially when you're getting inside the mind of really supernatural evil? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm in the middle of writing a supplemental chapter in the last book right now. It's called Pandemonium Rising. Mm. Uh, so it's an inversion of Empyrean Falling. Uh, it's the last book in the series, and there's this chapter, and this always happens, where um, Satan is talking to a prisoner that he's taken, a faithful prisoner. And the faithful prisoner is the first created angel. Um, not an archangel, but the first created angel. And uh, and it's it's ultimately leading towards like a conversion experience of sorts, you know, where, where Satan gets convicted for the first time, possibly ever, you know, uh, by the other, by the first angel preaching to him. But you still, I always feel oily and gross after Mm. (laughs) delving into these characters, psychologies, Mm. especially when it's like Mazarel and his rival, Umbra Tempest, who are both fallen angels and they hate each other, you know, or, or Satan and uh, Asmodeus, you know, or one of the other fallen. And man, you just you have to get into their psychology so you understand what their motivation is and what their um, what their flaws are and what what flaws drive them, I guess. So, like, what's the what's the critical thing with, you know, Asmodeus or I always call him Asmodeus, but I'm mispronouncing it. <clears throat> what's the thing that you know, Asmodeus or Giad Althaziel or Mazarel or Umber Tempest or any of these characters, you know, who are who are fictionalized or not. What's their motivation? What is and and what is that sin inside of them that that motivates them the most, at least in this scene? And, dude, sometimes like I just get bummed out. I just, <laughs> I just got to go like, yeah. you know, I got to go outside and just like have a smoke and let the dog out and just go mm. for a walk and just, you know, <laughs> listen to some DC talk. And just, <laughs> and just, you know, I got I to gotta just like decompress. And hope know? God does a new thing. <laughs> That's a deep DC talk pull, by the way. That's, that's pre-Jesus freak. Good for him. That is pre-Jesus yeah. freak right there, baby. I'm but, old school. But yeah, that's, I mean, you know, you know how it is, Derek. You know, you have to get inside of the minds of the characters. And man, sometimes that's a dark place, you know? And Braxo is kind of like that. Yeah, right? yeah, Braxo is kind of like that, too. Uh, Braxo, the, the villain of book one, uh, is you learn in, you know, later on in the series that he was a normal kid. Yeah, he was going through his own journey with the timepiece at one one point. Yeah, he was betrayed by uh, another kid, trapped in this world, uh, trapped in this particular world, and grew resentful and bitter. Yeah, and so his mission in life. Uh oh, our camera died. Oh, did it? Yeah, I can. We, we've uh, still got a still. Can, we've got a still uh, photo of of you up there. But uh, if you can if you can reboot, that'd be great. I can. I, all I need to do is uh, swap out. This is a great edit point, by the way. So, <laughs> right, When yeah. you see the tiki mug go up to Jonathan's lips, that's where yeah. you cut it. The leaky one. <laughs> Let yeah. me uh, just switch the battery in the camera. You know what's and, funny, uh, though, is that like continue. it's that resentment. I mean, the resentment is the same thing that um, – resentment's the same thing that got Lucifer, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, and Nick – I think Nick sort of – did a magician's nephew with uh, with that backstory. Am I right, Nick? A little bit. Yeah, it, it came yeah, out. Did, yeah, yeah, because I did um, 
the Broken Legs of War with this one's the backstory. That's right. Braxo. Yeah. You know, when he's a kid, he goes on that adventure where yeah. things go bad for him. It's a good thing we're not doing this live, Derek. So, so like a, wi- a wizard uh, equivalent of um, Gollum. A wizard equivalent of Gollum. Yeah, in a lot of ways. There's yeah. just, there, you know, pain, isolation. Pain creates isolation. Isolation opens you up to a ton of resentment, you know, because there's there's nothing there to, yeah. I'm sorry. There's nothing there to like really. Um, I got a stripper clip of 38 special. Will that help? <laughs> <laughs> we could okay. shoot the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure. But yeah, that uh, that that resentment, man, it creeps in because there's nothing there to combat the negativity. What, one of the things that Sharon I thought was really uh, insightful, and we talked with uh, Timothy Alberino uh, last year about his book uh, Birthright. Uh, which is about the uh, rebellion between the angelic realm and uh, God, you know, those of the angelic oh, realm that have fallen, cool. is yeah. the um, the parable of the uh, the prodigal son. Yeah, um, I mean, we are the prodigal son, the older brother who's resentful that they're going to throw a party that he's come back covered with pig mess. Mm-hmm. Is uh, are, is the are the loyal faithful angels? Yeah. Oh yeah. In fact, um, yep. that is a plot point of Pandemonium Rising. Ah. And, uh, yeah, and it's the whole – in fact, it's funny you mention that because the last – there are two or three chapters where uh, where that first angel uh, and Satan are uh, conversing. They're having a, a dialectic, you know. Um, and the last chapter that they are together is actually called Prodigal. And it's that very same thing, of, mm-hmm. you know, because in in Empyrean falling, the the whole the whole crux of like or what broke Lucifer's back mentally was the creation of humanity. You know, now you can theologically you can argue when in the timeline, you know, the fall happened for me, for the sake of writing and telling a good story. I decided, <clears throat> you know, that the angels had helped God create Earth. They created Eden, and then the and then Lucifer created the garden, and it, it, he was thinking that this would draw their father back because they had been separated from him. Mm-hmm. And instead of drawing father back, what father and the son did, who's Christ before he's named Christ for Jesus, uh, is they created another version of themselves. And Lucifer was like, oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? Like, we're being replaced. We're being Mm -hmm. absolutely replaced. And then so he goes on his journey. But then it becomes even of rebellion, you know, and thinking like the angels are going to get cast out. Like we have to we have to protect ourselves, you know. But then it it develops more into this prodigal thing of like we were here first. And 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 even the faithful, like we've done everything right. We fought and struggled. And you're just going to, like, let these humans in, you know, these humans who rejected you and killed you, Mm -hmm. you know, and like, why, you know, and then they're going to judge us in the end, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's got to be a tough. And when you view it from that perspective, from uh, the the perspective of the uh, the angels who are much older, much wiser than we are, and they can do all kinds of stuff that we can't do. Yeah, and And battle hardened and have been fighting losing friends in the war for souls. That most of us don't even acknowledge yeah, it's like yeah. why are we fighting for these these monkeys? <laughs> right, it's it's like yeah, monkeys. it's like uh, yeah. oh gosh, the, the, what's the movie? Prophecy with Christopher Walken, Viggo Mortensen. Yes, yeah, when he plays Lucifer, and yeah, right, oh, and uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Christopher Walken plays a very disgruntled Gabriel, lousy theology. But again, the reason that we are talking with the Goss brothers today, and why we uh, encourage other Christian fiction authors, uh, we're, we're you know, Brian Gadawa for one, with his Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, Chronicles oh, yeah. of the Watchers, stuff like that. We need more of that yeah. to show from a Christian perspective these um, mm-hmm. yeah. values of of love and honor and self sacrifice and truth mm. and beauty, because we're living in a world that is uh, rejecting the notion that those things even exist. I mean, yeah. in a postmodern world, there is no truth. There is no beauty. And that's why we see all of this ugliness and hatred around us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's disgusting. You know, I mean, when you look at when you look at society that has rejected God, it is a it is a carnival of grotesqueries. Mm. You know, it's just from yep. stem to stern. 
it is absolutely abhorrent. And and you know you can you can have God and still be messed up. You know you can be a Christian and still be disgusting, but but that's like a almost like a flip of a coin depending on your psychology and where mm. your faith is. You know, but but almost a hundred percent that if you do not have the Lord in your life, like it's not pretty. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so final question, wonder, final question for yeah. each of you fellows, because we sure. could we could keep going. This this 45 minutes or so has gone by very, very quickly. But oh, uh, yeah. in the interest of keeping these programs to a manageable length for people with busy <laughs> schedules, I, I try to <laughs> leave the audience wanting more rather than saying, boy, I wish he'd done less. Um, <laughs> I, I want each of you to, to just address this real quick. Uh, uh, what do you hope readers take away from your writing? Mm. You want to think about that and let me go first? Yeah, if, you, if you're prime, let me, you know, well, no, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I, I hope readers take away. I hope they take away the fact that it's okay it's okay to ha- to celebrate your values as a Christian. Oh yeah. It's okay to not have to fit in everybody's theological box, but you value the right things. Yeah. Because that's before the world st- was lit on fire, you know, over the past few years. <laughs> we had a lot of different theologies. Yeah. You know, and uh but we all shared some very core values. Yeah. We all had um for the most part, uh, you know, people who believed in God. I mean, we had a we had a worldview that we could share. We yeah. knew that, that these things were important. Uh, so, what was frustrating then is that, you know, to get a story published out there, you had to like meet a very specific set of criteria when it comes to your theology in order mm-hmm. for publishers to get it out there. Yeah. I want people to take away the fact that you can be creative, you can write and enjoy reading all of these fantasy worlds that don't fit that you know, specific, you know, theological criteria, but still have the values uh, that uh, make a story great and you can feel safe sharing with other people. Yeah. That's what I really want. Some validation, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I I want parents to feel like this is something that's safe for my kid and it's going to take them on an imaginative journey. Yeah. And Christian validation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Replace fear with faith. Uh, on and and faith in the Lord, faith in the truth and sovereignty of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. and every decision, every decision that every character makes in the story uh, that is detrimental is a short-sighted fear-based decision. It is a lacking of faith every single time, uh, even the good guys. In fact, it turns out really bad for some of the good guys because they they just they get caught up in this in this terrestrial, you know, corporeal fear, you know, this this fear, this fleshy fear, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and every time miracles happen and amazing things happen and, you know, victories are achieved, it's from in a Christian sense, these angelic characters letting go and letting God like there are and, and they fight. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like there is there is blood and sweat and tears and spit and just gnashing of teeth. And, you know, it's it gets pretty messy sometimes um, a lot of times. <laughs> but, you know, these characters, they always they always much like Nick is talking about. They try to do the right thing. No matter the consequences, they try to march up to the wall with their armor bearer, whether I mean, it literally happens towards the end of Empyrean falling with with Michael. Like, it's just like it's hopeless, you know, but it's hopeless from a from a short sighted terrestrial perspective, even Mm -hmm. though, you know, these angels are not, quote unquote, given unto death in the cosmology of Empyrean falling. They can still be slain, sort of, you know, mm-hmm. in the sense that they can be s- killed in battle, and then they, the fallen go to hell, the faithful go to heaven, you know, or they go to the Empyrean. But still, there there is that fear that they wrestle with, like I don't want to, I don't want to leave my friend, I don't want to leave my brother in arms, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, 
they deal with that a lot, and sometimes they make terrible mistakes because of it, and it costs the kingdom a lot. But every time anything good happens, man, they're just it's because they just had faith that there's a plan and that there's one God. I'm not that God. That God is that God. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's got a plan, and I'm just going to do what I think the Holy Spirit is telling me to do and let the chips fall where they may. There you go. That, that's the challenge as a Christian writer, isn't it, to uh, try to portray God fulfilling his will through yeah. imperfect characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because what, what does what does God look like? You know, it, <laughs> get up once again, you know, make a dorky DC talk reference, but like love is a verb. You know, it's, I know. Yeah. Everybody's right. like, all right, I'm going to one star every one of Jonathan's books for being such a nerd. <laughs> fair. I'm going to tell you right now, audience, fair. Um, no, but, you know, love is a verb. You have to act out those things. What are you acting out? Are you acting out your own selfish manipulation, your your witchcraft, you know, trying to bend reality to your will? Or are you, or are you acting out prayerful, you know, godly love? Not this Luciferian love of like, you're okay and I'm okay and, you know, you can be your own hero, you know, you can be, you can be your own Thor. It's like, no, <laughs> you, you are a vessel and a vassal for the Lord, mm. you know, and when you are that, like, I mean, there's even a line in there, you know, of like going from vessel to vassal, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it being a good thing. Going from an Achilles, a warrior, to a Leonidas, a soldier, someone who's willing to do the right thing no matter the consequences. Yeah. Nick and Jonathan Goss, they are authors and co-hosts of the Goslings podcast interviews that strike down the darkness. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, <laughs> I will link to your author pages at Amazon, but uh, where else should Thank people you. go on the web to follow your work? Uh, well, they can uh, follow my work at nickgoss.com. Uh, they can follow me on Instagram at, uh, what is it, Nick Goss Writes. That's right, <laughs> at Nick Goss Writes. Those are the two places you can find me. And, of course, you can find us on our YouTube page, uh, YouTube channel, uh, The Goslings. Yeah, right. The Goslings, and then um, at Heavenly Realms Novels on Instagram. Um, that's probably the best place to reach me. And then uh, there's a Facebook page for The Heavenly Realms novels as well that people can always find me on so awesome yeah. all right i will put yeah. all those links in the show notes uh nick jonathan thanks very much for your time really enjoyed the conversation we'll have to do this again loved it man this has been Eric, this is such an honor it thank is you. an honor being this on your podcast really, thank you really yeah this is really huge it's a treat and yeah. we can't wait to interview you again on the goslings yeah. i mean if if you're open to that in the future yeah. we absolutely love it. absolutely awesome because have, you're you're that conversation we had about your book the second coming of saturn oh yeah was phenomenal yeah yeah, I've awesome. gotten several people to buy and read your books. Since well, then. thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I encourage we, it. We would love yeah. to have you back. Yeah, I, I look forward to doing it again. Uh, again, all the links are in the notes, vftb.net or wherever else you're uh, consuming this podcast. So guys, uh, we'll talk again. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks, Derek. All right. See you, bud. I have a strong feeling that we will have the Brothers Goss back on this program sooner rather than later. Um, it is really interesting to see guys who are authors of any you know gender male female whatever who are writing using this kind of theology that we talk about uh sharon and me uh, as fodder to tell stories because uh, again a lot of what passes for christian fiction and has for many many years is based on a very simplified christian theology where there's an altar call and everybody gets saved at the end and we know just looking around at the world that uh, this is observably not how life often works Life is messy, complicated. Some people just refuse to see. And yet there are those moments where the miraculous happens. And um, we ultimately will be rewarded not for two sets of rewards. You know, if we've accepted Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses one through three, as Paul lays out the very simple gospel, the gospel by which we are being saved, believe that Jesus Christ, in accordance with the scriptures, died for your sins and in accordance with the scriptures, rose again on the third day because it's all about resurrection at the end. Great. Believe that you're in, but then there will be rewards for our activities here on this earth. So, uh, Let's not confuse that with earning our way into heaven. That is, not a, uh, that is not a thing. God has won the victory. 
Very often he allows us to be tested to our limits in situations that we would prefer not to have to endure. But over and over again, as with so many of the characters in the Bible, Sharon and I talked about that this morning on our Gil- Gilbert House Fellowship Bible study. Uh, characters like Abraham, Jacob, David, Samuel, who uh, I had forgotten the first time we went through the scriptures. We read that uh, the sons of Samuel behaved very much like the sons of Eli, the high priest who raised Samuel. Basically set up for themselves a little money-making scheme at Beersheba in the south and were taking bribes and perverting justice. Not ruling justly like Samuel had done. We saw the mess that was caused by David's sons fighting one with another. Solomon obviously didn't raise a very good son in Rehoboam at least not very wise. But over and over again, we see this, these imperfections in the characters that God used in the Bible to accomplish his will. And the same, the same can happen in your life and mine. If you just say yes, like Jonathan and his armor bearer, yes, we will charge up that hill and God's will be done. And with a gifted storyteller like my wife, like Nick Goss, like Jonathan Goss, like Brian Gadawa, and many other authors. I, I'm not excluding others. It's just I don't have as much time to read fiction as I, as I used to. Tolkien, Lewis, Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. Those characteristics, those traits, those ideals, of love, self-sacrificial love, loving one another as Christ loved his church, can be told in a way to inspire and motivate people. Sharon gets emails on a fairly regular basis. People who find comfort and encouragement in the stories of spiritual warfare that she depicts in the Red Wing saga. And that's why we do it. Love to write nonfiction, getting excited about writing fiction again, and it's been too long since I've completed a manuscript. So working on that now, in fact, Sharon had a better title than the working title I was uh, using for the next book. So uh, I'll be stealing that. All of my good ideas come from her. Anyway, we, uh, as you're, uh, if you're watching this, the first night of release, uh, the 24th of July, we're going to be in uh, the Dayton, Ohio area this coming weekend. So we hope you join us there as uh, we'll be part of the uh, the crew at the Go Therefore Conference. This will be in Brookville, Ohio, the Harvest Revival Center. Pastor Neil Peterson is uh, hosting us there. Pastor Mike Spaulding and Kathy Spaulding putting this together. Some help from David Paxton, another good friend there. But we're going to see so many old friends there that we are just look, really looking forward to this conference. Pastor Mike Spaulding, of course, Carl Gallups, Dr. Michael Lake, um, Boy, one of the experiences, most memorable experiences we've ever had was traveling to uh, hear the Watchman Conference uh, back in 2017, the Great American uh, Eclipse. And our flight out of Springfield got delayed to the point where uh, we had five minutes in Denver to get from one end of our terminal to the other end to make that flight to Boise. And uh, we just said, we're not going to make it. We're just going to go to the United Airlines desk over here and try to figure out what else we can do. Mike tried to make it. And Michael Lake's a big dude. So watching him run down the terminal, that, that, that is a sight that we will remember forever. It took us 18 hours to get to Boise that day. That was uh, something. So anyway, love Michael Lake, David Hevner, Casper McLeod, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, um, Kenny C., Tom Dunn, and then uh, some folks we will be seeing for the first time, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, Dr. Stella Emanuel, and uh, others. You can get complete information at the website for the conference. Go thereforeconference.com. It's uh, just $59 to register. Go thereforeconference.com. If it's too late for you to make plans to travel, and of course the cost of gasoline is uh, kind of an obstacle right now too, you can um, stream video. Uh, streaming video is an option. You can get information at the website and uh, sign up for that as well right now at go therefore conference. Dot com. We'll be out in uh, California mid-September. Details on that as soon as I can uh, point you to a website for that. Uh, L.A. Marzulli, Tim Alberino, and me, we will be speaking along with Pastor Dave Bryan. This will be a Church of the Glad Tidings, Church of Glad Tidings in Live Oak, California, September 15th, 16th. Um, more on that as that information is released. And, of course, next spring, 
we are looking forward to getting back to the Holy Land and seeing these battlegrounds in this long supernatural war. And we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, March 19th through 30th, our 2023 tour of Israel. Do take the optional three-day extension to Jordan. Petra um, Madaba, we see the world-famous Madaba map. That's a mosaic from the 6th century Byzantine era, a uh, mosaic map of Israel on the floor of this church that's been preserved for 1,500 years. Absolutely amazing. And then, of course, Mount Nebo. And the more we learn about uh, that region in history, the uh, Moses and the Israelites camping on the plains of Moab between Mount Nebo and Jericho, which you can see from the mountain, and uh, the fact that Sodom was in all likelihood located at about 2 o'clock. If Jericho straight ahead, Sodom was at 2 o'clock. Um, check out our last couple of Sci Friday episodes, interviews with Dr. Philip Sylvia about the scientific research going on at Tal El Hammam, the site of ancient Sodom. And uh, this is where Ezekiel puts the end of the War of Gog and Magog, the Valley of the Travelers East of the Sea. We'll be talking about all of this and preaching all along the way. It's like a rolling conference in the Holy Land. Skywatchinisrael.com or you can go to gilberthouse.org. In the top menu bar, there's a link that says travel with us, gilberthouse.org. And uh, from there, you get information and links to reserve your place on the tour. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen wherever you are checking out this podcast. If it's at the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash gilberthouse, please give it a uh, like, subscribe, and uh, share that link around with your friends. Of course, we're also at uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, and wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our announcer is the inimitable DC Good. And we do this because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. <laughs>